The combination of circus performer, sewing enthusiast, salvage DIY history buff seems such an odd combination. How did you get interested in this eclectic mashup? Hello friends and welcome back. I'm Shannon Makes and you, it seems, have some questions about me and so today I will be answering them. To celebrate 40,000 subscribers, I put out a poll asking for some questions, what y'all wanted to know about me and you definitely delivered. I got tons of questions and they can pretty much be categorized into five main categories. That's circus, sewing, YouTube, recycling, dogs, and then there were a few that kind of go into this miscellaneous category. So I thought we'd just sit down and have a fun casual chat. Maybe I can keep you company while you do some cleaning or some crafting and I can answer all of your burning questions. Plus I thought maybe to keep it a little bit more on topic as well as we go, I can share some of my favorite vintage sewing patterns that I've got here just so you know, we keep it in the sewing theme. Let's get going. First thing, let's start with circus. So hands down, the question that I got asked the most was some version of how did you get started in circus? What is the story behind that? And it is a really long story, so I'm not gonna go too much in detail because I think I could probably take an hour to tell the full story and we're not here for that. So in a nutshell, when I was young, I got started with gymnastics. I actually wasn't maybe that young. I feel like all of my teammates got started when they were four, five, six years old. I was 10, maybe even 11 when I got started, but I was already, you know, turning cartwheels by myself in my backyard. So my parents decided that they should probably enroll me into an activity with some supervision. They put me in a gymnastics program at my local university, and I'm happy to report it was a very fun, rewarding, healthy experience and environment. It's probably a large part of the reason that I'm still working with my body to this day was that it was just a very healthy experience. So that was fantastic news. I did that for many, many years. And then right around early high school, I discovered also a local circus recreational circus program and my friend and I joined up because we had already taught ourselves how to juggle. We were walking on stilts that we had built for ourselves. So we decided to enroll just for fun in one session of this recreational circus program. And of course it went really well because gymnastics just transfers pretty naturally over into the circus arts. And I liked it so much that I stuck with it for a long time, eventually, I dropped off the gymnastics and focused entirely on circus, purely recreationally, but I did spend like pretty much all of my free time doing that. And as part of this program, they like to bring in occasionally professional circus artists to give workshops. So we would have professional artists coming in every now and then to teach these workshops. And one of them hooked me up with the Montreal circus scene. They were like, you know, you should go get some professional coaching because I think that you have, you know, a good enough level or you have potential. I don't know exactly what they saw in me, but they did give me the name and phone number of a professional coach here at the National Circus School in Montreal and I gave them a call, sent in my stuff so they could see kind of what I was doing and was approved to like come and train with them. So again, completely recreationally, I was not thinking of doing this professionally at that point, but I just wanted to get more training and better training and a more intense experience. So came up to Montreal, stayed here for a month taking private lessons. I was still in university. I think I was doing it during summer break and it was really challenging, but I absolutely loved it. And so I kind of kept going back occasionally here and there. Couldn't do it that much because of course, at this point I was in regular university. I didn't have that much money uh, and didn't have that much free time. So in like little breaks here and there, I would travel up to Montreal just for like a week at a time, pay for some private coaching, get a tiny bit better, you know? And then at some point decided uh, I should maybe just wanted to give it a try professionally. I graduated university with a BA in English, um, but was not at all passionate about it, did not want to do anything with it. 
and was like, you know what I really love is circus, so let's just let's just give it a try. And yeah, that's kind of how I got started with that, and I've been doing it for 15-ish years at this point, and loving it, really happy that I made that decision. So that's the nutshell version of how I got started. Next, Alyssa E asks, did you always want to be an athlete or a performer? No, definitely not. That came way late on in life. I think when I was little, I wanted to be a jockey and then I wanted to be a veterinarian. Basically, I wanted to do something with animals because I absolutely adore animals. I was super passionate about horses, if you couldn't tell. So no, I definitely did not always want to be an athlete or a performer. I got a lot of questions that were kind of travel related, wanting to know how many places I've visited throughout my job, how many countries I've been to or lived in. And so it's it's quite a long list and I'll probably forget them if I try to do it off the top of my head. So I'll just give you a, a nice little list over here. These are all the countries that I have performed in. Some of them have been only there for a week or two. Some of the others like Copenhagen, I was there for three years. That was a bit exceptional. That was because of the pandemic. Um, I'm like frequently in Germany. So yeah, I definitely have done a lot of traveling and hope to do, you know, some more in the future. Okay, next we have Naomi who says, congratulations, I love your content. I always find myself wondering what does your daily routine consist of? And then she talks about balancing the need to stay in shape for performance and my job and then versus like how much time I spend on a sewing project. And I was thinking about maybe it could be kind of interesting to do a day in the life video where I kind of go through one day of, you know, what a day with me looks like. But then I realized, Honestly, I don't have any sort of routine. My days vary wildly. There is sort of a standard morning routine up until the point where I am, you know, fed and watered. But beyond that, it, it can vary incredibly a lot. Like there's usually some sort of physical training. There's always taking care of Canal and making sure she has well exercised and trained. And then there's often some sort of sewing or YouTube or some some aspect like that but the order in which it happens really can vary wildly sometimes we're on the phone with companies working out the details of contracts uh but then i also have to have good lighting to be filming so it's it's a lot to juggle and i was thinking like honestly it would make more sense almost to do like a week in the life because it would kind of maybe give a better idea of all the things that kind of happen in a week over here but the thing is those are really those don't get a whole lot of views people don't come to my channel for the vlogs it's hard to give them catchy titles and thumbnails which means no one clicks on them which then means that i spend hours and hours filming and then more hours and hours editing kind of for not a whole lot of result, which is a bit of a shame. So if you are interested in that kind of thing, let me know. Let me know what you would want to see, what would interest you. Is it a day in the life type vlog? Is it a week in the life? Is it something else that I haven't even thought of? So let me know because I mean, I'm here to, I want to put out things that, you, excuse me, I want to put out content that you guys want to watch. So let me know what it is you're interested in seeing and I will definitely take that into account when I'm making my videos. That actually leads me really nicely into the next question, which is, do you plan on doing more videos about your circus stuff? I think that'd be really cool. And again, I've kind of waffled back and forth on how much circus do I put on the channel? Do I put it on the channel if it has nothing to do with sewing or very little, you know, is how much are people here are going to be interested in seeing something that is purely just about the circus aspect of my life and doesn't have anything to do with sewing. Obviously, if there's a contract coming up where I'm going to be needing to make new costumes, that'll probably work its way onto the channel because that already, I'm already doing sewing content. But purely circus stuff, I could do it, obviously. Like, and when we have a contract coming up, 
can give some interesting behind the scenes stuff. I do already do some of that for my Patreons and my coffee supporters. They get a little bit more of that behind the scenes stuff. Um, like when I was in Germany for Christmas, they got a little bit of the lowdown on that for sure. But I can do more if people are interested in more. So again, let me know in the comments below. Then there were definitely a series of circus costuming questions like, do you need to sew as part of your circus, you know, aspect needing costumes for your performances? Did I start sewing before or after starting doing gymnastics? And also people asking about the specifications of circus clothing because they imagine that uh, it requires very strong and sturdy costumes. So this is something that I am super interested in and very passionate about. So first of all, to answer your questions, yes, I do often make some of our costumes. Sometimes I can just purchase them. Like sometimes we just go to the thrift store and find a costume. Depends on what the costume is. Sometimes I will make them. I have made my own costumes. I will try to find a picture of a couple of the ones that I made and put them over here with varying levels of success. That was definitely a learning curve. But um, yes, I have sewn my own circus costumes. I do continue to occasionally sew at least parts of our costumes. For the most part, now they're established. So unless there's a new contract that needs a new specific costume, I'm not so often doing, like I don't just pump out costumes on a regular basis because yeah, they take a lot of time because they do have a lot of specifications. But one of the other things I was thinking about is that there are exactly that. There are so many specific little things that are requirements as part of our costumes and that those things depend very much on what discipline you're doing and even what tricks within that discipline that you're doing. As someone that has performed professionally many different disciplines, I already have a very large and broad understanding of what each of those costumes require for me specifically when I'm doing my acts. And they're very different things. Like a costume that I will use if I'm doing tissue is gonna be very, very different than what I'm going to be wearing when we do our sway pool. And that's also very different from sear wheel. It's gonna be, are you wearing shoes or not? Are your legs covered or not? Are there parts of your body that have to be covered? Are there parts that can't be covered? Are there certain parts that need to be reinforced because of a specific trick that causes a lot of strain on that part of the costume and how do you go about reinforcing it in a way that doesn't cause the rest of the costume to kind of absorb that shock and, and tear. So I have been thinking a lot about this. Clearly I have some thoughts. What I was also wanting to do was actually to go around and interview a lot of my friends because y'all don't want to just hear from me like why don't I get some of my other friends who are doing other disciplines and just do like a series where I interview different people uh, in different disciplines and ask them about their costume experience. I think it could be quite interesting. Um, it's something I'm very interested in and something I have experienced a lot so I thought at some point, I would love to kind of beef up my setup and get it to the point where I can do some nice interviews with my friends and bring all this stuff to you because it's both circus and costuming and kind of very intriguing to me as someone who sews to see how we have to work around these various problems and make costumes that are beautiful, that add to the act, that may or may not help tell the story, but that also function so that you can do your number safely and you don't get burned or you don't slip, whatever it may be. So let me know if that's something that interests you. I think eventually at some point I'll bring it to the channel. I just need to flesh it out a bit more, let's say. So now we can move on into the section of questions that were about sewing. And the perfect transitional question actually comes from Kathy and Accidentally Steve, who wants to know, did I start sewing before or after becoming a gymnast? Unfortunately, I don't have a specific answer for you because I do not actually remember when I started to learn how to sew. But what I can tell you is that the two garments that I remember learning or wanting to sew specifically to make were pajama pants and 
leotards. <laughs> So I did actually at some point make pajama pant style warm up pants for my entire gymnastics team and I was probably somewhere between 12 and 14 years old when I did that. I still very specifically remember the, the fabric that I got to do that. And then the other thing was of course leotards because we didn't have a ton of money growing up and leotards were freaking expensive. Like let me tell you, they were so expensive and yet I wanted all of them. They were so pretty. I wanted all the pretty leotards and it's very hard to find pretty leotards in a thrift shop and they were crazy expensive if you would buy them new at a competition or in a catalog. So I was like, you know what? I know, I know how to sew. Like, why don't I learn how to sew a leotard and then I can make all the leotards that I want. Um, so that was one of the very first things I learned how to sew, which of course, if you're sewing like, you know, lycra, spandex, and elastic, it can be a little bit tricky for sure. Um, I remember generally having pretty good success with that. I will say I have one hilarious story about that. And that was one of the styles of leotard that was super popular when I was little was like the um, two colored split tone leotard where the top half like usually from here up was one color and then the bottom half would be another color or a complementary style print, something like that. It was pretty popular and I really wanted to do it. And so I found some blue fabrics that I really liked. I remember specifically one was a crushed light blue velvet. I don't remember what the other one was, but they were only two way stretch. And generally you're supposed to make leotards with four way stretch. But I was like, you know what? It's gonna be fine. I really wanted this fabric. I was like, I just really want a leotard out of this. And I really want it in this style. So I got the fabric and I sewed the leotard. And um, let's just say I had a wardrobe malfunction in the middle of practice one day and that the way that I had styled the leotard, instead of having the section, the, the divide between the two fabrics be here, it was, it was perfectly on my nipple. And that was the seam that failed, let's just say. And I was so embarrassed. It was a very embarrassing experience. I mean, my teammates and my coaches were amazing about it and I just got a shirt and wore a shirt for the rest of training, but there was definitely a nip slip moment in young Shannon's life. And after that, I don't think, I'm not sure if I ever sewed another leotard with that, that seam. I definitely learned my lesson about using two-way stretch versus four-way stretch. Yeah, but then generally, actually, that was one of the other most commonly asked questions was some version of how long have you been sewing? How did you get started? When did you get started? I just learned on, we had a machine at home. My mother sewed occasionally, still does. I learned on our you know family machine. It was my great grandmother's. I don't remember how old I was. I'm not a very patient person, so I'm sure that it was I was probably taught when I was much younger and then like it just, I wasn't patient enough for it. It probably didn't start sticking until I had something I really wanted to make, which was probably those leotards and those warm up pants and the pajama pants. So I was probably, and scrunchies. I had so many scrunchies because you could just make the leotard and then with your scraps, you'd make a matching scrunchie. Um, but yeah, I was probably somewhere around the age of like maybe eight when I was first taught, but I guarantee you it didn't stick and that I was too impatient for it. Uh, and it took the motivation of having a garment that I specifically wanted to make. And by that point I was probably 10, 11, 12, somewhere in there, let's say. Then a very similar question that I got a lot of variations of, but not quite the same was how did you get so good at sewing? How long did it take you to learn to make clothing that you were comfortable wearing in public and that you don't look back on and cringe? How did you learn to do pattern alterations? Why, like, why, how are you so good? Basically, um, I just made a shit ton of mistakes. If we're going to be completely honest about it, I was young enough to when I started sewing that I just didn't really mind if I made a lot of mistakes. I was absolutely not a perfectionist about it. But yeah, honestly, I just sewed what I wanted to sew and I didn't really pay a whole lot of attention to 
the mistakes that I made, like if it could fit on my body, I would put it on and didn't worry too much about the fit. And I wasn't trying to do anything that was super tailored when I was 10, 11, 12 years old. You know, I was making baggy pajama pants for my team. Um, and then I kind of stopped sewing, did a little bit here and there, did a lot of like more things like bags. I really enjoy making bags. I made a, a custom bag for our circus equipment. I know I have a picture of Phil modeling it here. I'll throw up for you. And I made a lot of leather gaiters. I've made hundreds and hundreds of trapeze boots. I'll put some pictures up for you to see. Yeah, that was about it. And then I started the YouTube channel and was like, okay, well, let's, let's start making clothing. This looks like fun. Let's do some historical clothing. And then from there, it was just like, let's find a pattern. Let's figure out how to modify it. I've got Google. I've got YouTube. Like, it's literally just most of my knowledge comes from googling stuff <laughs> i i i not like i've gotten this question so much i think i need to make a video in which i show how much i google at every step of the way to learn something new or i'll be like scrolling pinterest and be like hey that's a fun new technique i haven't seen before let's try and incorporate it into the next video like i always try to to level up a little bit, try a new technique, learn, let's do some embroidery. Let's do a combination Hong Kong and flat lining scene because like that one I saw on Pinterest and it looked really pretty and I was like, let's just incorporate it. So that's how I got good. I have no institutional knowledge. I did not go to school for sewing. Uh, they don't teach you how to sew as part of an English degree. So a lot of it's not worrying about messing up. Like if I mess up, I just, go back and redo it. I think that a lot of people feel like they're not allowed to make mistakes or that if they're making mistakes, that makes them somehow a worse seamstress or sewist than the next person. That's absolutely not true. We all make mistakes all the time. I generally try to show at least some of my mistakes. I don't show all of them because there are so many that get made. At some point, I don't really need to s show all of that because it gets boring. But I do try to keep in a lot of my mistakes because apparently not everyone does that. And I think it's leading to this misconception that if you're a good, a good being a good sewist means you don't make mistakes or that you make very few. That's absolutely not true. And it's it's the same in performing too. Like being a professional circus artist does not necessarily mean that you never mess up. Obviously the technique needs to be there in terms of you need to stay physically safe and be able to perform your tricks without hurting yourself. But on another level, like you will sometimes mess up. It's inevitable and it's not about not messing up. It's about knowing how to continue and keep going, how to pick up the routine and get back on the music. Same with sewing. It's just about like, oh crap, I messed up this part. What's the plan to keep going? How do I work around this mistake? Do I have enough fabric to go back and recut it? Do I have to pick some seams? Do I have to alter the pattern a little bit because I don't have enough fabric to fix my problem? So I, I think that it's just like that. I don't mind if I mess up and I don't let it stop me if I mess up. Obviously it helps that I am neurotypical. I am very able-bodied. I have a good amount of energy. So like I can go back and redo things when I mess up. That's definitely working in my favor. But I think just trying not to be discouraged if you make mistakes goes a long way. Next question from Beth Green. What kind of things did you make when you first started sewing historical stuff and how did it evolve to what you like to make today? I honestly haven't made very much historical stuff. If you go through my whole channel, I've been doing this for what, two, a little more than two years now. And I've made my sports corset, my uh, Edwardian Miss Frizzle. I did a wearable mock-up of the corset for the Miss Frizzle, uh, as well as the bum pad. And I have my 1911 skirt that I drafted. Other than that, everything else is pretty much history bounding or vintage. And so it's kind of like a little bit of a misnomer. I sometimes I introduce myself as historical costumer by day, circus artist by night. And I always feel like a little bit of a fraud because honestly don't have a lot of historical costuming on the channel. That's what I intended it to be when I started out, but 
if we're gonna be quite honest, y'all know how I am fairly thrifty and environmentally minded and also practical to some extent. And it just feels like my brain has a hard time spending so much time on a project and spending so many materials and all that fabric on something that will probably get worn once in a video and then that's it. At the same time, I do love the way these outfits look. So I probably will do some of them. I do have like very specific plans actually for some of them, but they'll probably just get sold afterwards or given away because I don't have room here to keep them. I'll probably never wear them again. I'd rather they go to somebody who wants to wear them. Um, so that's why you see a lot more history bounding and vintage stuff on the channel because I'm like that I can wear. That I'll get use out of and it feels so much more worth dumping the time and energy into. So that I guess is the answer. That's how things have changed. I started the channel thinking, let's do historical costuming and very quickly realized my brain doesn't like the concept of how impractical that is. And then I switched to more history bounding and vintage stuff. So next, Jenny Ann asks, do you ever get completely obsessed with a project? How do you manage all of your responsibilities and create such fabulous and high quality items? Uh, and I did have a couple other similar questions that were like, how do you juggle doing all of these things at once? Uh, the answer is I feel a bit like butter scraped over too much bread most of the time. I feel like I'm trying to do too many things at once. Uh, those of you who follow me on Instagram, hello, here's my handle if you'd like to, but I'm about to admit that I'm very bad at it. I have my hands so full trying to juggle, not only just performing and like staying in shape, but also all the admin stuff. We're completely self-employed. So I'm constantly sending out emails, looking for jobs, talking with directors, trying to see, hey, is our apparatus going to work on your stage? Negotiating contracts, making sure the conditions are correct, all of that stuff. And then I also have another full-time like hustle, which is the YouTube, which is like, not only do I have to make really cool videos, but I have to actually make the thing, which takes so long. And then I have to edit it. It's it's a lot. It is it really does feel like I'm doing two full time jobs <laughs> at the moment. But yes, to answer your other question, I do often have multiple projects going at once. I wouldn't say I'm completely obsessed with a project, but I am often completely immersed by it because the whole like filming process, it's very much easier for me if I can try and focus more or less on one project at a time. But at the same time, I do often have multiple things going at once. If you are a monthly supporter of any type and you have access to my monthly vlogs, you will know how much, how many like things I have running in the background. I have to start a lot of projects really early in order to kind of start thinking about them, start like planning them, start slowly amassing supplies, especially because, you know, a lot of time my supplies are thrifted. So that means sometimes I can be keeping an eye out for fabric for months before I find it because, you know, if it's not in the thrift shop or on the side of the road, then I just have to wait till it is. And that can take a long time. Ooh, next question is a great one from Kelly Hicks. When deciding between two similar patterns, what is your deciding factor to prefer one over the other? Nine times out of 10, it's size inclusivity. I'm trying to get better with that. It is harder when, of course, a lot of the patterns I'm working from are actual like vintage patterns, not even reproductions, because they often came in only one size, like size medium. That's it, it's just a medium. There, there are no like multiple size options on this, but I am trying, like generally speaking, if I'm gonna be going out and purchasing a pattern for something and there's two options, I'm gonna go with the one that's more size inclusive because I try to support the business that is doing the size inclusivity work because I think that's quite important to me. Ooh, here's a good one from Laura Murphy who asks, how does living in Montreal affect your crafting and would you do things differently if you lived elsewhere? I feel like it's less about the city itself and more about my ability to have tools that make things. Like someone else asked, where does my motivation come from? I've always had a desire to make things like capital M, capital T. I have always made things my whole life. When I wasn't sewing, I was using some other method to make things, whether it was woodworking or 
you know, constructing things out of cardboard. I have always been a maker, so motivation is not a problem. I would say that making things is the one thing that I miss most when I'm traveling for work because generally speaking, it takes tools to make things, you know, like, I know that I've shown, especially in the last two videos, that you don't need fancy tools to make cool clothing, but you still need a sewing machine, especially because I really hate sewing, hand sewing, long like uh, seams, just a regular straight stitch or a back stitch. I can't stand it. You still need a ruler and a scissors. Like there are some very basic things you need in order to make things, or at least the type of things I like to make. That's actually one of the reasons I learned knitting is because I can travel with knitting way easier than I can travel with a sewing machine. So it's less about what city I'm in and more about, am I in that city for a contract? Is it a short contract, a long-term contract? If I'm somewhere where like Copenhagen, for example, where originally I was going for 10 months and then it turned into three years, that's enough time that it's worth it for me to acquire some tools to make things. But if I'm going to be in Singapore for 10 days, I'm basically not going to have the time or the energy to be making things. It's not worth it for me to source a sewing machine. So I think it's really less about the city itself and which specific city I'm in and more about the context of why I'm there, how long I'm going to be there for. Yeah. Now for the questions relating to YouTube and the YouTube channel. Uh, someone asked, what editing software do I use? I use DaVinci Resolve. It's free. That's literally the main reason why I use it. Also, it has the animation tab, which is fantastic. I like to do some pretty intense edits every now and then, and this definitely lets me do it. Someone else asked, did I hone my editing skills during the quarantine? Um, I was making videos purely for fun uh, when I was younger with, you know, actually a, an actual handheld camcorder with the little miniature tapes and then editing them on iMovie. So I used to do like a resume of a, a summary of every summer for like three or four summers. I have these videos from when I was like a teenager. That was fun, but that was also, you know, iMovie. So it's very limiting. It's a great resource if you're just getting started and you're wanting to make videos for free. It's very intuitive to use, but you can also like, it's also very limiting if you want to do anything more advanced. So like for me, I wanted to start being able to put like multiple layers of videos on top of each other. Well, in iMovie, you can only have one, unless they've changed it. But as of like two years ago, you could have your main video, you could have one overlay layer. I often use up to 10 easily. So what I would have to do is I would have to take the video, overlay a layer, export it. So now that's one file. Those two layers are now one file. Then I would import that one file and add a second overlay export it, bring it back in. Now it's one file that has three layers on it. That one file, add a fourth file, export it. And I was like, I was losing so much time doing this. It was so finicky and it, it was like, I had things I wanted to do that it wasn't working for me. So then I um, got convinced to switch over to DaVinci, mainly again, because it was free. And the fact that it's an incredibly powerful tool uh, does not hurt. Someone else asks, how far in advance do I plan videos? I have literally given up on trying to stick to a schedule for most things because my life is chaos. And every time I sit down and try to plan out a content calendar, uh, it goes to crap. Every time I try to write down my content calendar, it, it inevitably ends up getting messed up or something happens like our flag means death kind of drops and it's an amazing show and I'm super inspired by it. And then all of a sudden I find myself making a series of three instructable videos on how to make uh, one of the robes from that show. So things like that are also constantly happening. So basically I, I have an, a running list of video ideas that's probably this long. Again, if you're a monthly supporter, you've heard me go through them because I tend to talk on a monthly basis in my vlogs about what um, what's the most upcoming projects, what ideas I've had. You'll know that I've got 30 or 40 ideas running at any one time and I have a vague order of when I'd like them to come out, but there's no, there's no hard and fast schedule there. Ooh, someone else asks, how long does it take you to film and edit 
a video. The filming really depends. Like it depends on what type of project I'm doing and what style of filming I'm doing. If I'm going to do a lot more montages with music then, and that takes a lot more camera angles, then it can take it can take up to three weeks easily because not only do I have to make the thing, but I also have to film the thing and it depends how complicated the pattern is. But then there's other styles of video that are a little bit less intense, like uh, the vest video that just came out. You'll notice it's a lot of more me talking to the camera and then that there are some shots like laid over me talking about it. Those are a little bit less intense. You'll notice there are a little bit, like the montages are a little bit shorter and that's just because like that week I was running out of juice and time so I had to get it done. Those take a little bit less time to film. They still minimum, bare minimum is a week. And then editing, generally speaking, I'm right around industry standard, which is takes me one hour to edit one minute of footage. So, I mean, if you go look at my catalog, all my videos, they're generally between 24 to 28 minutes long, which means I'm spending 24 to 28 hours in the editing room, which is um, another reason that I'm so incredibly thankful for all of my monthly supporters who really are like helping to, to make it happen. Like that's so much time that I'm dedicating to this that I could be dedicating instead to searching for more jobs, sending out more emails to get more performance work. But the fact that I have these monthly supporters that are kind of helping me to literally to pay the bills and also to make bigger and better videos, I'm it makes it so much more easier and it makes it, it literally makes it possible for me to put these videos out because if I was just rolling on AdSense alone, um, I would have to make fewer videos because I would need to be putting in even more time on trying to get work and possibly accepting jobs that were not as thrilled about accepting. So right now we're like fortunately at the point where we're both happy to really only take jobs that we're super passionate about, which is which is great. We're like not at that stage where you're early in your career and you're just desperate to get work and you'll take anything even if the conditions aren't great. We're fortunately like far enough in our careers and also we both have a supporting income, me through YouTube and also Phil, uh, he's a skydiver. So he works doing tandem jumps on when in the summer when there's no contract. If there's a contract, we both stop and we go do it. Otherwise, if we don't have a contract coming up, I'll be here filming and that is largely thanks to my monthly supporters. So again, a huge thank you to those of you who are supporting. And I know that that's like, this is not great financial times. Some of you might wish that you could, but just aren't able to. I totally understand and just like keep giving the video a thumbs up, share it with your friends if you think it can be useful or if you have sewing groups on Facebook or on Reddit, like just sharing the video around, leaving comments, all of that helps the algorithm and it also really helps just to build like a sense of community here. It's so fun to go in my comment section and see the conversations you guys are having. Some of you like have like full conversations back and forth in my YouTube comments, which blows my mind. I love it. I think it's great. Um, just building a really fun little community here. So, wow, I just very rudely got cut off by a dead battery. But anyway, just coming back to say a massive thank you for everyone that has supported me so far at this point in my channel, 40,000 of you who are here, who show up for the vast majority of my videos and leave me amazing comments and are just, such a great community to be around. So thank you so, so much. I am incredibly appreciative of everything. Hello everyone. I am in the middle of editing this video and it is so incredibly long already. So unfortunately, I think I'm going to have to cut it off here, even though I know I didn't get to nearly all of your guys's questions. If I did not answer yours, I am so sorry, but just it's already over a half an hour long and that's a little bit too long, I feel, for me to be talking about myself. So I hope you had fun. Thank you so much for sticking with me so far if you've made it to this point. I hope you learned something about me. I hope you got some fun crafting done or that your house is a little bit cleaner now and that you were entertained. If you want to see a part two to this video, maybe we can do another part two. I mean, most of it's already filmed, right, at this point. So just let me know down in the comments. Let me know, answer some of the other 
the questions that I'd asked so far, like what you want to see coming up on the channel in the future. Um, I think that's basically going to wrap it up for this video. Thank you so much for sitting through me rambling and what feels like incredibly narcissistic. Um, but you guys had questions, so I answered them. I hope you enjoyed it. And I will see you in my next video, which hopefully will be, you know, involve a little bit more making something and a little bit less just me sitting and blabbering at the camera. Thank you so much. And I'll catch you in my next video. Bye. What is this wave?